What's up, everybody? My name is, of course, Mark Carter with Midwest Astro. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Tonight, we've got a special one for you. But let's go ahead and start it off with just a little bit of B-roll. Wait, that was not at all B-roll. That was in fact the final image that we captured tonight with this particular telescope here. If you wanna learn more about what it is you're looking at and then how I actually acquired it, be sure to stick with us here as we go into a deep dive of M1 or Messier 1, the Crab Nebula. So one of the best reasons to get into astrophotography is because of targets like this particular one one that gives you a different meaning and perspective on life in general, right? Stars also are birthed, they live and they die and they go out in a spectacular bang. If any of you have seen the movie Moneyball with Brad Pitt, you remember the one scene where it's towards the end of the movie where they're sitting down and they watch this kid get up to bat and he hits the ball and he takes off out of the box running as fast as he can and hard as he can because he believes he's gonna stretch the single into a double and he trips and he falls and he hurries back to first base, not realizing that he had actually just hit the ball 30 or 40 feet over the fence for a home run. He was so passionate about what he was doing and that he was gonna make the most of this opportunity to make a double. So astrophotography, in my opinion, is sort of like that. Right? We're consistently imaging objects in space that in our lifetime and human lifetimes, we will never get to go see and visit, touch and feel and experience. So we can merely only capture their photons as they arrive here in the end of my telescope and hit that camera right there at the back that you see now. And in some cases, this light or the photons have traveled tens, hundreds of millions into the billions of light years just to make it to this camera. It's truly hard to grasp how many quadrillion miles or even kilometers that this light has traveled just to get to us. It's hard to truly grasp the vastness of space and what it is we're actually looking at. We do need to hit on what exactly is a supernova, right? Many of you may not know, I'm sure a lot of you do, but let's go ahead and talk about it, right? What is a supernova? One type of supernova, which is what we're gonna primarily be looking at tonight, is considered a last hurrah, right? It's the end of a dying star. Now, one thing to consider about these last hurrahs is it does require the star to be at least five times larger than our very own. So you have to consider that massive stars are born with a lot of energy, but it also takes a substantial amount of energy to keep them going. So they burn huge amounts of nuclear fuel or hydrogen at their cores and centers. This produces a ton of energy, right? You can see all the energy right now that the sun's casting onto me and I can feel it, it the heat, but imagine if it was five times larger. So this produces a ton of energy when it's burning its nuclear core and it gets incredibly hot when it does that. In this heat, what it does is it generates pressure and the pressure created by a star's nuclear burning also keeps that star from collapsing. So a star is in a perfect balance between that pressure pushing outward and gravity pulling inward. So the star's gravity is always trying to squeeze it in and that's why you get this perfect circular, right? Because gravity is consistent no matter where it is, whether you're on this side or this side or up here or up here, that's why it's circular because it's all being pulled by the same exact equal force depending upon your distance from the core. And again, it doesn't matter where around the core you are, it'll always be the same, just like we have here on Earth. So again, that nuclear burning is what keeps that pressure pushing outward and it's incredibly strong to do so and that's why they're so massive. This outward push resists the inward squeeze of gravity. So when the massive star runs out of fuel, it begins to cool off and then next thing you know, boom. So this causes the pressure to drop 
and gravity will always win out. So the star will suddenly collapse. So imagine, imagine something one million times the mass of Earth collapsing in just 15 seconds. Should we look at it? Done. That's how long it took for a star to effectively die. Was that 15 seconds? So this collapse happens so quickly, in fact, that it creates this enormous shock wave. Just like any explosion we see here on Earth, it has a shock wave. And the stars, when they explode, are no different. And that's what causes the outer part of the star to actually explode, is this shock wave. Usually a very dense core is left behind along with the expanding gas cloud that we call a nebula. A supernova star of more than 10 times the size of our own sun may leave behind something that is actually considered the most dense object in the entire known universe. You got it, a black hole. Why is it so important to talk about supernovas and the type? Well, if you don't know, the Crab Nebula is just that. It was a last hoorah of a dying star, and it exploded in this fantastic explosion. And it happened about 6,500 years ago. It was actually in 1054 when Chinese astronomers actually took notice of this, and they called it a guest star because they weren't sure how to explain this light that came out of nowhere and it lasted nearly a month and you could even see it during the daytime like how incredibly bright does something have to be that we can see it in the daytime in outer space we can barely see the moon when it's full during the daytime but we can see it but imagine something else was so bright you could see it during the daytime. And that particular explosion in 1054 AD as observed is what we now know as the Crab Nebula which is a six light year wide remnant. And again, remember, our solar system is only about 1.2 light years. And I know I've said that a lot, but it's only about 1.2 light years. So the Crab Nebula with an apparent magnitude of 8.4 and located about 6,500 light years away from Earth can be observed with just a small telescope. Now, it is in the constellation of Taurus, but again, you can spot it even with binoculars. Now, I do recommend a good sized telescope. This telescope is at 666 millimeters with this focal reducer. I personally would recommend something closer to 1600 millimeters. However, if you have a really good camera and your pixel size is correctly matched, you can just crop in and still get a decent image, which is what you saw earlier. I gave you the full image and then we zoomed in and we cropped it in basically to show you what details actually exist in this particular nebula. So the nebula was formally discovered by an English astronomer named John Beavis in 1731. 1731, think about that. So Charles Messy then observed it himself, but he actually mistook it at first for Halley's Comet. Because he actually mistook this incorrectly, he actually created a catalog that we now know as the Charles Messy catalog. In that way, it would prevent other astronomers from mistakenly identifying something as a comet or anything else when it wasn't. When the Crab Nebula exploded, it actually left behind a rapidly spinning neutron star, which is an ultra dense core of the exploded star. And it's embedded right in the center of the nebula. The electrons are actually whirling at nearly the speed of light around the star's magnetic field lines. And they produce this eerie blue light in the interior of the nebula itself. This neutron star is actually ejecting twin beams, so one out of each end. And it pulses nearly 30 times per second as it rotates. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and leave you guys. Thank you so much for joining tonight. Clear skies, take care of each other, and we'll see you next time.